Remain standing afterwards for uh, singing. You know, there are scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about the resurrection of Christ, or the resurrection. This is one of the best ones. Daniel chapter 12, 1 through 3, a prophecy of Daniel about, about the last times. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Now read with me. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Let's praise the Lord.
sing the song of the redeemed. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. You are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives. The King has come from heaven, darkness trembles at His name. Victory forever is the song of the redeemed. My Savior, my Savior lives Every day a brand new chance to say Jesus, you are the only way My Savior, my Savior lives My Savior lives My Savior lives Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. A brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives. My Savior Amen. Woo. You may be seated. We're going to have the ushers come forward for offering, and I'm going to do the scripture during that time. The scripture comes from Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Father, God, we are singing some awesome songs this morning. We're just having so much fun just worshiping you and glorifying you. And Lord, there's another way to worship you, and that is to give to you from our pockets financially, Lord, to trust you, Lord. So we trust, God, that you're going to use this for your good and that you're going to bless us for giving to you, Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus 
Father God, for washing us all white as snow, for coming here to be with us and, and to show us how to live and to show us how to sacrifice, Lord. Thank you for your almighty, wonderful, blessed love, Lord. We are so blessed, aren't we? We're blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to have a children's message wait, wait right up second. here. We're doing a wait a second. So children can we're come forward. We're going to do a Tony message. Oh, Tony we're doing a Tony first. message. Oh, sorry guys, we're not doing children's message right now. We're having a Tony message. I'm not messaging. I'm it's just singing. It's a story. <laughs> it's a story. I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story with song. It's a, a beautiful story. the windows fastened down I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day we'd find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gates began to rattle, and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they moved him in the night, and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away, and now his body isn't there. We both ran towards the garden, then John ran on ahead. Said. But the winding sheets they'd wrapped him in was just an empty shell. And how or where they've taken him was more than I could tell. Now something strange had happened there, but just what I did not know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. Cause I'd seen them crucify him, and then I saw him die. Now back in 
inside the house again the guilt and anguish came everything i had promised him just added to my shame when at last it came to choices i denied i knew his name even if he was alive he wouldn't be the same Suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide And I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried He raised me to my feet as I looked into his eyes Love was shining out from them Like sunlight from the skies My confusion disappeared in sweet release And every fear I'd ever had Just melted into peace still come on up kids is that everybody okay. okay that's fine all right guys who remembers what was special about last Sunday a week ago no that was two Sundays ago what was last Sunday special day the Jesus watching video day the Jesus watching video day awesome yeah, I did that sometimes too. Yeah, cool. It was Easter, wasn't it? Yes. Did you guys miss Easter? Yes. No. No? Did you have Easter somewhere? Yeah. No. Oh, that's a shame. Well, it was Easter. Now, what do you do on Easter that you like the most? What? Eggs. Eggs. The ones with candy or the ones that you color? Both. Both, cool. What do you like most that you do on Easter? Eggs, yeah. <laughs> um, hiding the eggs. Hiding the eggs. That's fun too, isn't it? Yeah. So, so somebody else can find them? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Crafty people like you and me like that sort of thing, huh? Yeah. Okay. What do you like most on Easter? Looking for eggs. Looking for eggs. Very good. You know what I like most about Easter? I like remembering that Jesus rose from the dead. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. Yes. Jesus rose from the dead on Easter. That's what we celebrate. That's why we celebrate Easter. But do you know, I have a thought. Hey, boys, keep your elbows to yourselves, okay? 
Yeah, no, I'm serious. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, do you know that as Christians, we can celebrate Jesus every day? Hey, Reese, did you know that? Yeah, we can celebrate Jesus every day. Can we celebrate Jesus today and not just on Easter? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, can we celebrate Jesus on Monday? Mm -hmm. But we're not a church. I know, but we can still, still, still do it. Home. We can celebrate Easter at home? We can celebrate Jesus at home? Yeah. And All the time? And school. That's awesome! And school. I want to be able to do that. Here's what I want to do today. On Easter, we tend to say this funny thing that we only say on Easter. We say, He is risen! And then the other people say, He is risen indeed! Have you ever heard people say that? No. Okay, we're going to try it together. I'm going to say, he is risen, and you're going to say, he is risen indeed. Okay? Can you guys help him out? Okay, ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Way to go! Now, we only say that on Easter, but it's important all the time. So I just wanted to celebrate Easter again with you this morning for a little bit. Okay? One more time. He is risen! He is risen indeed. Way to go. All right, you guys can go to Children's Church or you can go back to sit with your families. Okay, go find Mama. <laughs> yes, I love you. Okie dokie. Let me add my good morning to several good mornings you've received already. Uh, did you guys know it was Easter Sunday today? Yeah, it is actually, believe it or not, in some churches. It's Easter Sunday today, and next Sunday, and the Sunday after that. Do you know in the Catholic Church they celebrate Easter for seven weeks straight? Hey, Jean, do you think we'd have time to sing all the good Easter hymns if we celebrated Easter for seven weeks straight? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we might. Um, it's true. We, we have this odd pattern in our, uh, in, you know, most churches I've ever been to, where Easter Sunday is something that we celebrate for a day, and then uh, we tuck it in our pocket and take it out next year. And what we need is to have that resurrection power in our lives every day. As Christians, that's what we need. Um... I think most of us make a larger celebration out of Christmas than Easter. Is that true? Yeah? And do you sometimes find that after the hype of Christmas, you have this feeling inside like, well, that was fun and exhausting, but now what? And it feels a little odd to get back to your normal pattern. You know what I mean? I think that spiritually, if we do that with Easter, if we celebrate Easter for a day and then forget about it for most of the year, our souls should have a feeling like that. A feeling like, that was awesome! Now what? So today we're going to talk about now what? Today we're going to talk about how can we live in the power of the resurrection on a daily basis in our walk with God, and not just on Easter Day. Today we're going to recognize Christ's resurrection power in our lives by the ways he sets us free, and the ways that his love gives us new life. And there are a zillion of those. There are a bunch of different ways that the Lord sets us free. And so many different aspects of our life that become new because of his love for us. Today we're just going to look at a few of the big ones. All right? All right. Um, I'm also going to ask you, how many of you got the morning program, the bulletin? The beautiful picture on the front. Yes. Excellent. That has uh, oftentimes, but not always, sermon notes on the back. I don't know if you know about that. Today we're going to use those sermon notes uh, not to fill in the blanks from scripture and things like that, which are excellent memory devices. Um, today we're going to use it as a reflection page. And I'm going to pause at three different points in the sermon and ask you to spend some time in reflection. Just for a minute. And you can do that silently if that works best for you um, in your mind in prayer. Or if, it, if you're a processor and it's useful to use your hands to think through things, I encourage you to use those questions on the back and I'll refer them to you every time I ask us to pause and reflect. So if anybody would like one of those who doesn't have one, ushers, if you could bring some of those bulletins out. Does anybody want a bulletin for those reflection times that doesn't have one yet? We've got one over here and one over there. Anybody else? 
Excellent. Thank you. That's it. All right. Curtis says that's all. If you don't have one, tough. All right. <laughs> um, so we'll refer back to those in a bit. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 3. If you'll turn in your Bibles or the Bibles you find in the pews around you to Philippians chapter 3, we can read together. Just about every time I preach, by the way, I have to stop myself from singing the song of the books of the New Testament to find my book. I don't know why I felt a need to share that. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. Okay, Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 7. And Paul is talking, going to talk here about living in the power of the resurrection. <clears throat> okay, Philippians 3 verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Wow. Amazing. And for Paul, who, as far as we can see from the scripture, was so close to the Lord. The Lord had brought through ridiculous things. Had saved him from ridiculous sins and errors. You know, the man was so far off base, getting Christians killed. Um, and God turned him around so dramatically. And then he was close to God in an amazing way. Planted churches all over the Middle East and Europe and wrote a huge portion of the New Testament. That man says, I want to know Christ fully. A desire. Not something that already fully existed in him, but a, a hunger to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. If Paul can say that, I think it's safe to say that we can need that too. Yeah? Yeah. I think so. That's what we're coming to ask the Lord for today, to know him and the power of his resurrection. Here Paul's talking about having a righteousness, a rightness with God that comes from God on the basis of faith in Christ. He's talking about being right with God, not because he's worked hard to make himself right with God, and not because he's flawlessly obeyed the law, but because instead of being right by his actions, he's made right by faith only. That righteousness is a gift that he receives from God. Only Jesus could ever completely live out and fulfill the law. None of us has succeeded, even if we've tried. But because of what Jesus did at Easter, because of the resurrection, we can have a relationship with God, even though we've broken that law that God laid out for us. If there were no grace, then we'd have no way to come before God, because we'd have no way to fully live out the law. But because of the grace of Jesus, lawbreakers like us can have that relationship and that connection with God. So the power of the resurrection is freedom from the law. Or you might say freedom from legalism. We don't have to abide by that standard of behavior in order to have a relationship with God. Have you ever felt or believed that you needed to be sin-free before you could pray? That's legalism. Have you ever felt or believed, 
even though you have asked Jesus for forgiveness, that you haven't done enough good things to earn his love or to earn a place in heaven. Have you ever felt that? That's legalism. Have you ever felt or believed that Jesus is up in heaven watching you like a hawk, waiting to change your status from saved to not saved every time you blow it? And back from not saved to saved, if you remember to say, I'm sorry for when you blew it. Right? Have you ever thought that? Man, I used to think that. It was an immature understanding of forgiveness. And I'm so grateful that that's not actually how God works. That's a form of legalism. Legalism is one of the sneakiest tools in Satan's tool chest, I believe. Because only people who really want to do right would bother trying it. But it's a way for Satan to sneak in a small seed of doubt that erodes at our faith. You ever been to the beach and you see those holes in the stone that are round? They've been worn around by smaller stones or sand spinning around in there every time the waves go by? That's legalism. It's just a little thing. And if it makes its way into our soul, it spins around and grinds away at our faith until there's nothing left of faith and faith is just a word that we use when what we mean is I'm going to try and earn my way into heaven and I'm going to live under fear that I haven't done it yet. The resurrection power is freedom from legalism because of grace. And when we live under legalism, we aren't living fully in the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says to know Christ, to really know him and the power of his resurrection is to take everything that I've done right, everything that I could put on my resume to the Lord that's good, and throw it away. Because it's never going to be enough. It's meaningless compared to the grace that God gives us, compared to the power of knowing that resurrection in our lives. Only faith in the resurrection of Jesus can make us right with him. So the power of Jesus' resurrection frees us from legalism. And we see that power at work when, because we are freed from legalism, we can make our choices based on love. Pardon me. Instead of based on the law. Because the love of God is in our hearts. That's our guiding principle. Instead of the law. See, it's not that because of grace we we can do whatever we want. It's because of grace, the standard for behavior is different. The standard is the love of God in our hearts. It's actually a higher standard than the law. But it's a standard that goes hand in hand with grace. So we can survive it. We're able to live that out because God gives us the love. His love gives us new life by becoming our new behavior standard instead of the law. In Matthew twenty two thirty six, an expert in Jewish law asks Jesus what the greatest commandment is. And in verses 37 through 40 of that chapter, Jesus answers, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When we're freed from the constraints of legalism, we can make decisions based on our love of God and His love in us for everyone else. That's what the new life Jesus offers us looks like. Jesus' resurrection frees us from legalism and we see it bringing new life into us when we are guided by love rather than law. Now we're going to pause for a reflection for a moment. And you'll see these questions on the back of your bulletin, or you can just take some silent time for a moment with God to consider them. First, where do you see legalism wearing away at your faith? And second, do you see signs in your life that you are guided by love 
rather than by the law. Okay, you ready for more good news? The power of the cross does more than just circumvent the law. It also takes away our past guilt from breaking that law. Now, I know these two are all tied together. You can't really separate them. Having relationship with God and forgiveness from our sins, they're bundled together. But there is a separate freedom here that we can look at and live in when we're living in the power of the resurrection. Because the power of the cross frees us from guilt, the power of the resurrection gives us new life by allowing us to learn to love ourselves as Christ loves us and to love others as Christ loves them. When we are burdened with our guilt, we're not fully free to do that. Please turn with me, if you will, to 1 John chapter 1. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, all the way back there. <coughs> First John chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 8. First John chapter 1 verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. <clears throat> My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Sin leaves a stain on us that we can see if we're willing to look at ourselves honestly. Anyone who lives a few years or days making choices without God is going to have this mess of guilty stains on them. And now, we as humans are very wily and crafty. We are capable even of deceiving ourselves. And that's what's, uh, what this chapter is talking about. We're able to hide our guilt from ourselves if we work hard at it. We deny our guilt when we pretend it's not a big deal. We deny our guilt every time we blame someone else or our circumstances for our choices. We hope that that'll excuse us. We can even, and this is so crafty, we humans are so sneaky. We can even deny our guilt by admitting to wrongdoing in general, but refusing to look at our specific actions. Or maybe we just try not to think about it. No matter how we deceive ourselves, if we're doing that, we're making God out to be a liar. And his word has no place in our lives, and the stain of guilt is still on us. The power of Jesus' resurrection can expunge that guilt entirely as though it never existed. Have you ever seen... Well, of course you have. You know those commercials for laundry detergent? Where they take that shirt that's like, you know, the dog jumped on the kid and the kid landed in the mud and then he miraculously spilled Kool-Aid and coffee on himself at the same time? And the shirt just looks terrible. You can't really tell what it is anymore. And then they wave this detergent over it and it's new. Isn't that amazing? I've never seen a detergent actually do that. Um, that analogy fits God's cleansing of our guilt really well. 
You know, sometimes you have that shirt that has that really annoying stain and you can't get it out, but you don't want to throw it away, so you put the shirt on anyway and pretend it's not there. Fess up. Who's done that? I've done that. All right. Most of the men in the room and a few of the women. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty. All right. That's like denying our guilt when we come before God or come to the Christian community and we pre pretend that we're good and we've never sinned. Oh, I don't have problems like that. <laughs> Only really weird people have problems like that. Not me. Don't look at this stain. Don't look at that. That's not coffee. That's it's the exact same thing. The stain's still there. But when we come to God and we ask for forgiveness, we have to confess our sins and be honest about it and quit deceiving ourselves, because guess what? God is not deceived. He can get that stain out. Just like the commercial. It's absolutely amazing. This is the power of the resurrection in us. We don't have to deny our sin. We can acknowledge it so that he can remove it. The way to be without sin is not to pretend it's not there. It's to get Jesus to remove it from you. And you've got to be honest to make that happen. <coughs> That's the power of the resurrection in our lives. Psalm 103.12 says, Jesus takes our guilt and removes it as far away from us as the east is from the west. Now, if you're a Christian, you know this. The question is, are you living in that power? Are you applying Jesus' forgiveness in your everyday life? We see the power of Jesus' resurrection in us when, because we have given our guilt to Jesus to deal with, we start to see our insecurities and fears fall away from us. Self-hatred, self-loathing, self-depreciating language, deprecating. I'm not sure how you're supposed to say that. They all start to fall away from us when we live in the power of the resurrection. We don't insult ourselves in our minds anymore. When we look in the mirror, we start to see someone God loves instead of our stains from our past choices because those sins are really and truly gone. You know, when you start living in the power of the resurrection, you learn to take a compliment. It's a wild thing. When somebody compliments you and they're being honest, you no longer feel that really awkward, ah, what do I do now? I've been complimented. I'm supposed to deny it. I deny that I can do anything good. That's humility. That's not humility. Humility is seeing all the good things in you and knowing that they're from God and not from yourself and giving him credit. When you live in the power of the resurrection and the forgiveness of your guilt, knowing that you're cleansed, you learn to take a compliment. Whereas before, we either had to reject those compliments or we grab at them and try and build them into a false wall of pride to hide all of our guilt and insecurity. Right? You did really well at that. Why, yes, I did. I can feel good about myself now. When we live in the power of the resurrection and we know that we're washed clean, all the good things in us have come from God, we can accept those kind of compliments and just pass them right along. Why, thank you. Thank you, God. And we used to see other people through this screen of our insecurity and self-hatred. The effect was that we either idealized them if we could not see their faults, or we thought of them as less, just because the same way we thought of ourselves as less, because we could see their faults. Realizing that God loves us despite our flaws empowers us to love others despite their flaws, not overlooking those flaws and not devaluing the person because of them. The power of Jesus' resurrection sets us free from guilt, and his love gives us new life by allowing us to love ourselves and others the way that God loves us. Now we're going to pause for reflection again. And I ask you in the presence of God, in what ways are you still struggling with past guilt? <laughs> What signs have you seen that you are learning to love both yourself and others the way that God does? Your 
You ready for more good news? The power of Jesus' resurrection sets us free from legalism and allows us to connect to God. It goes further than that. Instead of just circumventing the law, it removes our guilt from breaking the law and gives us new life by empowering us to make our choices based on love in our hearts. And that love then spills over so that we love ourselves and each other the way that God loves us. It doesn't stop there, though. Jesus also makes us capable of learning to not continue sinning. How cool is that? You know, not all Christians agree on this. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things where, as a Christian, I have to acknowledge this is how I read the Bible, this is what I believe it says. Other Christians don't agree, and that's okay. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ. But man, I am so grateful for this. And I'm really glad that I believe it, because it's a gift to receive. That the power of the resurrection doesn't just mean our past sins are gone, but over time we can actually become more Christ-like. This gift is oddly tied to that first gift. We don't have to live up to the law, but because of the power of Christ in us, we can actually become more perfect, gradually, over time. That's what God wants for us. That's what he's doing in us. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm going to read Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. And if you wish to, you're welcome to turn there with me. Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. This is a bit of a big chunk, so I'm just going to read right through it as if Paul were here preaching, okay? I'm not going to use my slow scripture voice. <coughs> Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> what we're listening for in here is whether or not it's true that the power of the resurrection means we can learn to stop sinning. Romans 6, starting with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Do you catch that? Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him again. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because, here's the tie into that first blessing, you are not under the law, but under grace. Praise God! Amen. I am not here to tell you today that I am completely free of sin and temptation. That would be a bold-faced lie. However, I do see the grace of God working in my life, making me more like Christ as I walk with Him. And I hope that you see that in your life as well. What an amazing gift. John Wesley, the theological father of Methodism and, and one of its founders, wrote about what he called Christian perfection which is not an absolute perfection. It doesn't mean someone who never does something they shouldn't and always does everything they should. That's not what it means. 
Instead, he's talking about a perfection of love. If God gives us a gift of perfect love, then we will never, ever make an unloving choice. And if love is our guide for our behavior, then Wesley was saying, there can come a point in your walk with Christ where God gives you this gift and the law of love in your hearts decides 100% of your decisions. And you never make an unloving choice. You might still make mistakes. You won't understand everything. And so you're going to make errors of knowledge that affect your actions, but you're never going to intentionally choose something that's against the love of Christ. He says it this way. The loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. This implies that no wrong temper, none contrary to love, remains in the soul, and that all the thoughts, words, and actions are governed by pure love. Friends, this is the immense power of the resurrection of Christ. We can be free from sin. And the new life that his love gives us is Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness means that we can be free from anger and hate and live a life defined by love. It means we can be free from lust and gluttony and live a life defined by balance and health. It means we can be free from self-reliance and worry, which is an expression of a lack of faith, and live a life defined by peace instead. It means we can be freed from jealousy, greed, and selfishness and live simply instead and have the joy of giving. It means we can be free from idolatry. Idolatry is the word for when we put anything as more important than God in our lives. We can be free of that and instead live a life defined by wholeness and a connection with God. That's the power of the resurrection. Now, it's important to note some patterns of sin in our lives are rooted so deeply in us that we've accepted them as part of our identity. But even these can be dug out by the power of God if we are willing to let God give us a new identity, the identity he made us with to begin with. Some sins are so pervasive that we can't imagine going a day without them. A lot of these are actually survival mechanisms that we've used at some time in the past to make it through the pains, stresses, and abuses of life. But even these, God has even grace to repeal those sins from our lives if we're willing to engage into the grace that he offers us. And yes, it'll take time. But the grace is there. The power of the resurrection can handle even those. You might have to receive grace from Jesus from a source you didn't expect and you wish you didn't need, like a 12-step program. We have two groups here, a Wednesday night group and a Thursday night group where we use the 12 steps as tools for accepting Christ's grace in our lives to overcome both those sins that have entangled us and become pervasive and also to reach for healing for places that our emotions and our character have been damaged. That's one way that the power of the resurrection comes through to us. There is no sin that cannot be rooted out of our lives because we who have accepted the power of the resurrection of Jesus are no longer slaves. The power of Jesus' resurrection frees us from sin and his love gives us new life by making us more like Christ, closer and closer to that perfect love. So I ask you in the presence of God to reflect one more time. In what ways does sin, not guilt, but sin, still plague you? And what signs have you seen in yourself that you are, in fact, becoming more like Christ?
in each of these reflection sets, I've asked you, on one sense, a negative question. What problems do you still see that the resurrection of God can address, the resurrection of Christ? And on the other hand, a positive question. What signs do you see that the resurrection of Christ is changing you? And as we change, as we change gears to a time of prayer, and I invite the worship team back up to sing, I ask you to use these questions as your prayer guide this morning. In what places do you need to come before God and say, here in my life, your resurrection power is, is not functioning yet, and I want to open that up to receive your power there? And in what other places can you bring to God and say, here I have seen you change me, and I am so grateful? Please stand with us as we sing. This altar is open for prayer.
to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, 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 break every chain. of the resurrection and I want us to respond uh, by an action now and that action is um, I want you to raise your left hand and acknowledge that that the Lord has freed you from sin and guilt we're acknowledging what Jesus did on the cross and now I we'll want you to raise your right hand and say, Lord, by faith I accept the power of your resurrection that you might fill my life with that love of Christ to make me like you. Lord, you have the power to break every chain, breaks the chains of legalism, chain of sin, the chain of guilt. And Lord, there might be some here that have said, well, I'm giving up on that thing because it j I just can't do anything about that. Lord, we have new hope. In Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection, there is hope. And we acknowledge that you are Lord of all. Lord of us. Lord of all our circumstances. Lord of all our relationships. Lord of all. And we say, Jesus... You're alive. Come, Jesus. Come to our life. Come to our situation. And we praise you for that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now go from here in the power of the resurrection in your life. God bless you.